Hello, I'm Kate Delaney, and today we're talking with Dr. Edward Solarski from Sarasota Memorial Healthcare System about hip replacement, one of the most common surgeries in the U.S., with literally thousands being performed every year. Like many common procedures, there is always advancement in technology and procedures, and this is especially true for hip surgery. Dr. Stolarski, before we get into the new approach you'll be sharing with us, tell us a little bit about hip replacement in general. Okay, it's one of the few things that can completely change someone's life almost overnight, seriously. You have someone come in unable to walk, they can't keep up with their spouses. The big one we get is, I, I can't go to Disney because I need a cart. They come in, they have surgery, they do wonderful, and they're out running around again doing all their activities. At what age are most people getting hip replacements and, and why, Doc? Uh, most arthritis is wear and tear. You wear the joint out, we replace it. Our youngest hip replacement is 15. Our oldest is well into their 90s. But the average is someone who's retired. They want to stay active. They want to keep their golf game going, their tennis. And uh, so I'd say in the 60s is not unreasonable as an average age. Many approaches are becoming minimally invasive. Why is the anterior approach becoming so, so popular? Uh, I'll tell you, minimally invasive means different things to different people. You take the old posterior approach, they're minimally invasive, they're just making the incision smaller. You cut the same muscles, you just move that mobile window around. Same precautions, same inaccuracies. You look at the anterior approach, much more accurate, much, much less precautions. These people are going back to martial arts, police work, firemen, uh, FPL workers, which is our power and light people down here. So it, it's a life changer. Who would be the right type of candidate for this procedure? Anyone in the, in the need of a primary total hip. And when, when I say primary total hip, um, the other part of my practice are the big re revisions or redos. And I don't mean those people. I'm talking about someone that comes in with the wear and tear arthritis. They pretty much all qualify for the anterior approach. When would you not recommend this approach, Doc? The big revisions and people that have previous hardware. They've had a femoral fracture and they have a rod in their femur um, or they have pelvic uh, reconstruction where they had to have their pelvis put back together because of a car accident. They're very few and far between. All right, Doc, tell us the difference between anterior versus posterior. Well, I'll tell you, it's like night and day. I'm going to give you a quick scenario. Posterior approach, inaccurate guessing. You go to a physician that does a lot of posteriors because he's good at guessing. So when I do a posterior approach, which I have to do in my redos, we're going to lay the person on the side instead of on their back. Pelvis is moving. You're doing anterior, your pelvis is flat, you're on your back. I don't cut any muscle. Huge difference. Small incision, but more importantly, no muscles cut through the front. Through the back, quite a bit of muscles cut. When I am done my operation and I'm finished with what I think are the correct implants, I check it with fluoroscopy. So I bring a machine in while I'm working. It's an x-ray machine. It's live. And it lets me look at that hip. It, are my sizes right? Are my angles are my angles right? And most importantly, are my leg lengths right? So these people benefit of me being able to make small changes in the operating room to give them a much better outcome. Then I do a posterior approach. Do you know when I see that X-ray? I see that X-ray in the recovery room. Lastly, it's all is reflected on how they do post-op: kayaking, tennis, golf, policemen, firemen, getting back to work about three months after the operation. I couldn't do that with a posterior approach, and I was good. What are the typical differences recovery time-wise using this approach versus the traditional posterior approach? Well, it's day and night. First of all, posterior approach, you wake up. You wake up with a pillow between your legs. you got to sleep on your back. Don't cross your legs. Don't bend over past 90. You're going to pop this thing out. Anterior approach, you get up. You're up the same day. You can sit in a regular chair. You, you don't need to sit on a toilet that's so high you get a nosebleed. You still in a regular toilet. It is uh, even from day one. It's a it's a drastic difference. So there's a lot of research on the posterior approach, which has been used since the 1960s, but much less on the anterior approach. What can you tell us about the complication and success rates compared to the traditional approach? Well, it all has to do with the learning curve. The reason the posterior approach is so popular is that's how people trained. The guy trains me to do a posterior approach. The next person I train is going to do a posterior approach. So the learning curve is there for the anterior. You have to actually seek it out and try and find it. But I will tell you, the anterior approach is not new. I've been doing it for 10 years. I've been teaching it for about seven. 
it is, it's actually the way us as orthopedics operate on children who have an infection in their hip. It's an anterior approach. So everybody's familiar with it. They're just not used to putting total joints through that approach. So there are clear benefits to more minimally invasive approach, obviously, that you're talking about. Shorter hospital stay, smaller incision, yet not many surgeons are trained in this technique. Can you explain why? Well, it's growing like wildfire right now. When I started teaching this, it was maybe one or two surgeons would visit a month. Now we have 10 a month and we're, we're doing big courses, big cadaver courses throughout the country. So it's really catching on because they're seeing the benefits. Even if they don't see the benefits, or if they want to deny the benefits, they're going to lose the patients to the doctors that are doing this approach. So it's either you, you end up not actually doing any hips because nobody wants an old posterior approach or you learn the anterior. But I'd say that the, uh, the learning curve is significant, but once you learn it, you don't go back. When it comes to any new procedure, there's always debate in the field, you know that. What are some of the questions at issue, and how does a patient educate himself or herself and make an informed decision? I'll tell you the best way, I, I think that's how a lot of people find out about it, is through their friends and family who've had that approach. They'll see a, a patient that's a relative of theirs that have had a posterior approach on one side and an anterior approach on the other, and it's a world of difference. The other thing is just the internet. I mean, this uh, Google thing is new to me, um, but not new to many people. And so research, reading, um, talking to your physician. Uh, like I, I would have a physician replace my hip through the posterior approach if, if he was the only person that could do it and that's what he was comfortable doing. What's drawn you to take on the, these challenging cases, the most challenging cases? Yeah. I was an engineer before I did this and I enjoy the technical aspects of challenging total joints. If I just had to do primary total joints all day, I'd be very bored. I like to reconstruct people. We, we replace entire femurs where you connect a hip replacement to a knee replacement. Hemi pelvises where someone's pelvis is so deficient of bone we have to make it up with custom metal implants. Those, those are the challenges that I can take someone from a wheelchair and have them walking again. And uh, it's, it's, it's the satisfaction of helping people to be quite honest. You, besides the satisfaction with your work, you've been living on the Sun Coast for now about 10 years. What is it about Sarasota? What's your favorite thing to do there? Well, despite the uh, ton of money I spend on suntan lotion, uh, <laughs> we, have a, we have a great time. Uh, my boys and I do a lot of scuba diving, a lot of fishing. My daughter and I just enjoy riding the boat and just enjoying the sunshine and the beaches. Um, it's, an, it's a great place to work, but it's a better place to live. Ah, well said. All right, Doc, thanks. Thanks for joining us. To learn more about Dr. Stolarski and his new procedure, please visit smh.com slash total joint or feel free to call Sarasota Memorial Center for Total Joint Replacement Patient Navigator. Here's the number, 941-917-7356. I'm going to say it again, 941-917-7356. Doc, what a delight talking to you, speaking with you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much for, for coming on and doing this. Thanks for having me, Kate. You have a great day.